Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the webinar of the Internet 50th anniversary begins now. Welcome all of you. Before starting with the Pioneers panel, uh, I would like to invite Oscar Robles, LACNIC CEO, to welcome you to this extraordinary event. Uh, please go ahead, Oscar. Thanks, Maria. Uh, so we're ready to begin our uh, webinar. Uh, let me start by thanking first our guests, um, uh, Charlie Klein, uh, Leonard Kleinbrock, and Steve Crocker. Thank you so much uh, for uh, 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 being with us. It is, an honor, it is an honor having you here to celebrate 50 years of the internet with the community of Latin America and Caribbean. And thank you all of you connected to this webinar. Uh, welcome to this uh, amazing opportunity to chat with some of the uh, internet pioneers. Last week, we celebrated with a local event in Montevideo with the regional pioneers. In that event, we mentioned two different achievements uh, in the, the 50 years ago, uh, the moon landing and the first data packet sent over a telecommunication line. The former, um, the, the moon landing, received a lot of media attention in comparison with the latter. Um, it was actually covered live during several weeks. Uh, but from our view, uh, and I think many of you will agree on this, it is the second achievement that first data packet sent over the internet or over telecommunications lines, which uh, has been most relevant for human lives. It is, it is that event, that particular event that has touched billions of human lives. So I will stop here uh, to listen to our guests and uh, we let uh, Carlos Martinez, uh, LACNI CEO, to lead this uh, conversation, and I hope everybody will enjoy this webinar. Over to you, Carlos. Thank you, Oscar. I will share my video, so you can, you can. It's, I think it's a bit friendlier to have a face in the in the video. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, hello and welcome to all who have connected to this 50th anniversary webinar. Uh, my name is Carlos. I will be your host this afternoon. Uh, this webinar is organized by LANGNIC. LANGNIC is uh, one of the five regional internet registries, and uh, we are the bodies who are in charge of ensuring that IP numbers are globally unique. And this function, the need for IP numbers to be globally unique, is one of the things that uh, became very important very early on. Uh, on the, during the, the startup of the internet, and uh, we can trace our history to, to those times. We believe this anniversary is really worth marking, and uh, we have tried to bring to our region uh, the voices of the internet pioneers. If you're here with us today, you're using the internet. I'm not going to describe how the internet has deeply changed society, the huge impact it has had on almost every aspect imaginable of our lives. Suffice to say that this webinar brings together speakers and hosts from Uruguay, Canada, where the ICANN meeting is being held right now, and the United States. Registered participants hail from at least a dozen different countries. Well, have you wondered how it all began? As Oscar mentioned, it began exactly 50 years ago with a humble packet, two tiny bits of information that were transmitted between two computers in California, uh, which were both about 400 miles away. Indeed, as Oscar mentioned, the 60s were interesting times, uh, not necessary for all the best reasons, uh, the Vietnam War, but uh, we had also the space race, the music scene of the, scene of the 60s, and among these ground-shaking events uh, in 1969, there was the birth of the internet. This event that we will celebrate today has probably had the largest impact on our lives of them all. Today, we would like you to take, back, to take you back to the beginning of it all, back to those times and listen directly from those who were there, the stories of the birth of the internet. First, um, please let me remind you uh, of a couple of things. Please uh, remember to use the chat windows, either in Spanish or English, to send your questions. Please identify yourself and please identify the person you are directing your question to. And also, also please bear in mind 
that those who are listening to the Spanish audio channel, that this channel may have some delay due to the um, interpretation uh, work uh, we are doing today. So uh, let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have uh, Leonard Kleinrock with us. Uh, Leonard is an American engineer, computer scientist, who have, has made, I would say, key contributions to computer networking and computer science, and in particular to the theoretical side of computer networking. Um, he obviously, and as everybody knows these days, he played an important and pivotal role in the development of the ARPANET. Charlie Klein, uh, also a computer science, a scientist from UCLA. He studied under Leonard, so this is, a, this is a kind of, a, I would say, university reunion. Uh, Charlie played a role in uh, installing the first IMP, which is their precursor to the modern day router, which enabled the packet switching function on the ARPANET. Charlie sent the first successful message on the ARPANET. that uh, was intended to be the word login, or at least part of it, and uh, we will, I'm sure we will listen to that story today. Steve Crocker, Steve has, he's one of the, I would say better known uh, members of the internet community. He has uh, been with us since the inception of what we call the internet community that uh, ICANN and we, the IRRs are part of. Um, Steve was the leader of the network working group um, that led to the, uh, development of the ARPANET host-to-host -host and application protocols. He has been, been a member of the ICANN board for a number of years and uh, been also a chair of the ICANN board for several years. Another one of the original pioneers, um, Vince Cerf, sadly could not be here with us today, but he sent us, he, he sent us a few words on video and we will start our panel today with uh, Vin's video, and then we will uh, give the floor to Leonard first. Can we start the video now? Hello, my name is Vince Cerf. I'm Google's chief internet evangelist and sometimes uh, known as one of the fathers of the internet. I really appreciate uh, Maria Gallo's invitation to participate in your celebration of the 50th anniversary of the first linkage of two computers across the predecessor to the internet, the ARPANET. Two nodes at UCLA and SRI International were interconnected by the nascent two-node ARPANET on the 29th of October, 1969, literally 50 years ago. And that began an evolution which is ultimately uh, concluded uh, in the invention of and, and the further spread of the internet technology that you and many others use today. In fact, I'd like to uh, thank LACNIC for its role in helping to make the internet useful uh, in the areas of the world where it has responsibility for IP address uh, allocations, to say nothing of helping people uh, make use of the internet in various and sundry ways. So it's fitting that we should celebrate this 50th anniversary of a particular igniting event, but it's also very important to recognize that the internet still has a long way to go in terms of our understanding of how to make it work better, how to make it beneficial, how to deal with some of the negative effects of internet and the platform that is occasionally abused by people who don't mean us well. Uh, all of these things will require both technical, uh, regulatory uh, uh, conclusions, uh, or, or at least uh, regulatory responses, and those responses will need to take place across national boundaries. The uh, Secretary General of the United Nations commissioned a high-level panel on digital cooperation, a report uh, on which was uh, presented to the Secretary General in June of 2019, it called for in the in increased cooperation among uh, national entities and others in the private sector and the academic community and the civil sector in order to find ways to make the internet a safer, more secure, and more beneficial place to be in. And I submit that that's part of your job as well. So I hope that you'll take that burden uh, in hand and help all of us make the internet a better place to be. 
So happy 50th anniversary to uh, ARPANET and the subsequent internet. Thank you, Vince. Hello. My name is Vince. So um, we will start uh, our panel this afternoon. Uh, we will start with uh, Leonard. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but this is basically, I would say, an excuse for you guys to tell us the, 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 what, you, what, you, what you feel the, the best stories of the birth of the internet are. Um, so the first question is, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the prehistory of the internet? Let's say what was going on between 1957 and 1969, the events leading to the transmission of the first packets on the ARPANET. How did you guys get involved? Leonard, the floor is yours. Here, on October 4th, 1957, <clears throat> the Russians launched Sputnik, the first Earth orbiting satellite, and President Eisenhower in the United States recognized that the Russians had gained superiority over the United States in certain areas of technology and science. And so in response to that, on February 7th, 1958, four months later, he created the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, to basically fund science, technology, engineering, math, in the United States to bring our capability back up. And they funded schools, universities, research centers in all areas of technology and science. That was one thread that led to a piece of the ARPA that we're going to discuss. And basically what they did is they funded these centers in a variety of ways. And by 1966, they had been funding computer science for a number of years. And there were many centers, research centers across the United States that had built up excellence in specific areas. University of Utah had great graphics. University of Illinois had great high performance computing, etc. And they recognized that it would be a great idea to connect these research centers together through a network, which would allow one user at one site to log on through this network to a remote site and gain access to the capabilities at the remote site. So suddenly a need for a network which would connect computers together became real. Now let's go back to an earlier period because there was separate thread occurring at the same time. As a PhD student at MIT, in 1960, 61 and 62, I had decided that I was surrounded by computers and sooner or later, they'll have to be connected together and there was no adequate technology to allow that to happen. The telephone network was woefully inadequate. And so I decided to look at this problem for my research. It was a new problem, it was important. If I could solve it, it would have impact. And I had an approach to putting together a mathematical theory for how computer networks could be designed, optimized, and how would they, they would perform. So in 1962, I published my dissertation. Meanwhile, independently at the RAND Corporation, Paul Barron had been working on a similar problem. We were completely unaware of each other. He was working on a network to allow the United States to survive a nuclear attack. So this work was going on, and it was available when ARPA in 1966 decided they needed to create a network. So they came to me and they formed a committee of researchers headed by one of my former classmates at MIT, Larry Roberts. He was now employed at ARPA to make this network occur. And so a group, group of us got together. We wrote a specification as to how it would perform and be designed. This specification went out to industry to bid on winning a contract to implement this plan. The contract was won by a company called Bolt, Baranek and Newman. They were awarded the contract in December of 1968. And it was decided that UCLA, where I was now a professor, would become the first node in this network to be designed and implemented because basically we had the technical expertise to understand how it should perform and were able to then generate experiments to test it and find out where the faults were and how to improve it. The schedule was to bring UCLA online 
over the Labor Day weekend of 1969, less than eight months after the contract was awarded to both Baranek and Newman. And BBN delivered the first switch to UCLA on the Labor Day weekend, on time, on budget, up and running. They had created a new technology with new users and new applications in basically eight months, something that would be very hard to do today. The machine came in, and a month later, a second switch was deployed at Stanford Research Institute, 350 miles to the north, as you heard earlier. And the idea now was to connect these two computers together to test the use as it was designed, namely, sit at one computer, in this case, UCLA, log on to a remote computer, in this case, Stanford Research Institute, and attempt to log in so that, in fact, we could test the functioning. So that's the background that led us to the day you just described a few minutes ago, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, I would like to move to uh, Charlie. Charlie, what can you share with us? Um, I was working on the operating system for our computer at UCLA, and Len got the project from ARPA to connect us to the internet, and so I had to work on the issues of how we were going to connect our computer to the switch. Uh, one of the other graduate students at UCLA was a hardware engineer, and he was able to build the hardware we needed to interface the computer at UCLA to the switch. Each site was responsible for building its own hardware. You couldn't just go off the cell you know, and buy something. <clears throat> there wasn't USB standards or any other standards. Uh, the actual spec said, here are the signals. Here's the voltages. Here's the timing. You build something to make it work. And one of our guys did that, and he did an excellent job. And then I was working on the software to try to figure out how to connect to the switch and actually send something to it. And within a few days, we were actually able to send transmissions between the our computer and the teletype on the the imp. The imp actually had virtual computers in it that uh, virtual hosts they referred to, and one of them was the teletype. So if you sent a message to that address, it would print out things on the teletype. A month later, Stanford got theirs. The SRI got their. Uh, switch and Bill Duvall at SRI had to do the same thing and he got his stuff working and then we tried to see if I could communicate as Len was describing to the computer at SRI. Now his system was somewhat more mature and he was, was more able to build the part where uh, if I sent him characters he could actually interface it to the operating system. So I built an application where I could read characters from a terminal and send them to SRI and he, he would take them, send them into the operating system as if they had come from a local terminal. And then anything that was coming back from his system that would normally have printed on a terminal, he would intercept and send back to us at UCLA, and I would print it on our terminal. And it's been widely reported. I'm sitting there on a phone talking to Bill Duvall, and I'm saying, I'm about to try this. Uh, let me send you something. Now, this system required you to actually type the word login to log in. So I typed an L and he on the phone said, yeah, I got the L and I saw the L printed on my terminal. And I typed the O and he said he got the O and I saw that it printed on my terminal. I typed the G and he got the G, but then he said something went wrong. And it turned out that his system knew what commands were available at that time. And it actually tried to send back G I N. And at that particular point in the code, he had a little error where he didn't expect the three characters. So he said, let's try again in a little while. And about a half hour later, we tried again. And this time it all worked. And I was able to remotely log in and do things. And uh, it was it was kind of neat. I mean, it was late at night and it was kind of fun. And uh, um, so that was sort of the beginning. Meanwhile, Steve Crocker, who I'm sure will describe for you, was working on with groups of people about how do we make these systems actually do something other than just log in? How do we make them more general? And to follow on, on on one of the things Len said, there had been some previous networks, but they were special purpose networks. For example, the SAGE network, the Strategic Air Command network uh, in the late uh, 50 or early 60s, where uh, messages were sent from one uh, 
strategic air command site, uh, you know, nuclear missile site to another. And, but those, they were very special purpose. This was an intent to build a general purpose network, a heterogeneous network where the computers could be any kind of computer and the applications could be any kind of application, not just the limited sets of commands that the, the, the nuclear weapons needed. And so that's, that's was my initial involvement. I continued on as the, as the protocols grew to work on the protocols and to implement things. But, uh, and my personal com computer science research was in computer and network security um, later on. So. Thank you, Charlie. Now over to you, Steve. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a little bit unreal to think that uh, we can look back a full 50 years. One would never have thought that uh, this would have such a big impact. Um, as Charlie said, not only were we interested in uh, directly logging into remote computers, uh, but there was a, a kind of bigger vision that the computers might work together on a problem or that uh, uh, there might be other kinds of applications. So a number of us um, tried to think about the general case of how do you build protocols and uh, share these protocols across all the different machines. And most particularly, we understood that we were not going to get everything right all at once, that there would be ideas that would emerge later. And it was important to leave room to build on top of whatever we thought about. Uh, so we, we gravitated toward an open framework that you could have a base set of protocols, but then on top of that, you could add other applications. And so things like um, Skype and uh, um, HTTP, uh, the World Wide Web and so forth, were in a general way part of the vision that we had without knowing exact details of how all of those were going to emerge. So as, as, uh, uh, as Len has described and as Charlie has described, the, the uh, we formed a, a network working group of people who were our counterparts at all of the different hosts, starting with the first four hosts that were designated for the initial network and then expanding as the network expanded um, and developed both the social framework for us to work together and uh, the technical framework for building the protocols. Um, it, it seemed in a way straightforward, uh, I, I had other research ideas in mind and I didn't think that this was uh, as intellectually compelling as the uh, other ideas I wanted to pursue. I was wrong. This turns out to be pretty interesting stuff, uh, even from a research point of view, as well as the obvious practical uh, benefits. And then a short time later, short time in this, you know, when we look at a 50 year span, um, it became evident that we need to connect other networks together uh, for multiple reasons, internationally, different technologies, uh, different agencies and so forth. And that led to the birth of the internet. And here we are today. It's, it's absolutely fascinating to listen to, to these stories. Um, my, my first thing that comes to my mind is uh, after those initial messages, uh, how, what were the next steps? What did you do next? What, were the, what was the plan? Was there a plan, actually? Yeah, that's the right question. Um, most interesting, so, so Len described the uh, set of advisors and uh, working with Larry Roberts on a plan, and uh, that both Brannick and Newman had won the contract uh, from a formal bidding process. Uh, so the hardware part, the switches, the long distance lines that were procured from uh, AT&T, all of that was a well-organized plan that had a budget and had a schedule and uh, was managed quite, uh, quite carefully. The part that, uh, that I've described about trying to design these protocols was not at the top of the list of things that were uh, planned carefully and it was more a question of, well, we'll let the users figure it out sort of a field of dreams almost. Uh, and of course it was obvious that the network would be used for at least two things, the logging into remote machines as, uh, as you've heard, 
but also moving a file from one machine to another. But uh, the more advanced type of applications uh, were not thought very deeply about and were not part of a careful plan. And as I say, that emerged uh, during the process. So, um, Uh, uh, that I think is a quite remarkable situation because in leaving room for building more things, uh, it worked out exactly as expected. That is, ideas came from every place. Uh, different people made applications. There were uh, early experiments with speech. There were early experiments with graphics over the uh, ARPANET. It took a long time, of course, before the hardware uh, that we're using today emerged in a cost-effective fashion that everybody could use. But the uh, the basic vision of these things was clear enough even at the time. There was another aspect to it, uh, if I may. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. So Steve is properly describing the use of the network and the structure to allow that use. But beneath it all was the engine, the infrastructure, the network, and we were tasked to make sure that that underlying structure was working properly. So as I mentioned earlier, our job was to try to test the network, to stress it, to try to break it, and find out if there were errors that needed to be fixed. And so after the first two nodes, we got a third node in, in November and a fourth node in October. And we tested that four-node network for a number of months, trying to break it. We could break it. We could cause deadlocks and degradations and in inefficiencies. We found out some of the underlying issues, recommended how to fix it. They got fixed. We found others. There were a large number of software and hardware errors in the underlying infrastructure that we kept probing to make sure that these faults were found, fixed, and not occurring again. So there, there were basically two aspects. One was making sure the engine was working, and Steve and his group were making sure that the applications were able to be accessed and to come up. So it's a rather interesting parallel effort. We, we had a, basically different groups working on it. We had my PhD students at the theoretical end looking at the analysis, the experimentation, the optimization, the principles. And Steve, who was in charge of the software group, he hadn't mentioned that, hats off to you, Steve. You were basically pursuing those other aspects of using the network and setting up the protocol to allow that use. Shelley, do you want to add something? What did he say? <laughs> if you want to add something to this question. Um, There were a number of interesting stories from that time. Hello? Yep. yep. Oh, okay. I hear you. I just don't see me, but that's all right. There's a number of interesting stories. For example, during the bidding process, AT&T and IBM refused to bid. One of them didn't think it would work, and the other one wanted to use a different technology. They wanted to use circuit switching rather than packet switching, which wouldn't have worked at all. The, there were difficulties in, in trying to cobble together the 50 kilobit lines, which were done by taking a bunch of 4800 baud lines with a special modem that made them work together to create the 50 kilobit circuits that were used. BBNN had some interesting uh, examples of strangenesses when we just, there, there were always two lines to each site, at least in those initial sites, to try to get redundancy. So we had a line from UCLA to UC Santa Barbara and a line from UCLA to Stanford Research Institute. And they seemed to go down at the same time. It turned out AT&T was multiplexing both lines on the same physical circuit on different frequencies. And so when that line failed, they both lines, what we did, the redundancy didn't, wasn't really there. <laughs> and uh, BBN discovered that there were certain circuits that seemed to go out at strange times of the night, like it'd be down from 12 o'clock to 12.02 or whatever, and they called up AT&T long lines and said, uh, this circuit, and they gave some big long number, was down from 12 o'clock to 12.02 on the following day, we want a refund. And AT&T's comment was, how can you know that? We can't know that. <laughs> Charlie, Charlie, why don't you describe the headphone you were using to derive the voice line for your communication with Bill? Um, the on the same 
circuit that the uh, data was on, there was also a voice line, which was really there for the purposes of troubleshooting for the AT&T engineers. And so there was a headphone connected to the modem as well as the computer. Uh, we had this, it was like an old operator headphone that you stuck over your head, had a little thing that went down in front of your mouth and a little earpiece. And uh, it happened to have a very long cord. So it was convenient to have that on when I was trying to do things with say, for example, build a vault SRI, because I could sit at the terminal and have both my hands free and be talking to Bill. So we were using this, this weird headphone at the time. At least I was on one of the occasions. On the occasion of October 29th, I think we were actually using a regular landline. I don't remember 100%. Neither did Bill. I asked him the other day. And he, he couldn't remember either. <laughs> Let me um, uh, offer another little story. Um, so 50 years ago was uh, 1969. And the network continued to grow um, what seemed like a very fast pace of putting in roughly one new imp. Hosts were connected to that, sometimes just one host, but occasionally there were two or even three hosts at a site. Um, two years later, in 1971, uh, I took a break from my graduate studies and went to Washington to work directly for Larry Roberts at ARPA. Uh, and uh, the first thing he asked me to do was to go down and consult with an Air Force group that was uh, going to connect their computers to the network in order to, uh, to do a side-by-side -side test of uh, moving files across the ARPANET versus moving files across what, what was called AutoDIN, um, the uh, official US Department of Defense network. Um, so I went down and I consulted with them and I uh, uh, suggested that for the, this particular purpose, uh, to make it good, they should try to move the, uh, send as much data as possible. And uh, I suggested to them that they could set up parallel connections uh, instead of just sending a message and waiting for a response, they could set up, that say, eight parallel connections and then assemble the results uh, afterwards. Uh, what was not clear to me at the time uh, was that this would cause a flood inside the network. Uh, when they finally got their software working uh, several months later, uh, the network went down. And when I say the network went down, I'm talking about the entire network across the United States, and it died within four seconds. <laughs> now, these poor guys, uh, very competent people, uh, Air Force officers, uh, who themselves were graduate students, it turned out, in a nearby university, uh, they couldn't tell what was going on because uh, nothing happened. Meanwhile, up in, uh, up in Cambridge, uh, near Boston, uh, the folks at both Brannock and Newman saw the network go dark and started to work feverishly to bring it back up. And uh, they had to work with one host, uh, one imp after another. And uh, while they're working on it, these guys down in Texas, uh, in Oklahoma, uh, is where the Air Force Base was, uh, said, I don't know, let's try it again. Four, four seconds later, the entire network crashes. Uh, eventually, they discovered... Uh, each other and uh, brought the network back up. And, um, and in the course of that conversation, um, they said, well, Crocker told us to do that. Crocker at that time was sitting in a meeting in a closed room at MIT and, and, and uh, on a different topic. And somebody came in and uh, tapped my shoulder and said, there's a phone call for you. So I got on the phone and, and uh, there was somebody from BBN yelling at me. And he didn't even say who he was, although I could figure out who he was. And he accused me of doing it on purpose. And I said, uh, no, not really. Um, at that point, I was a government employee. And I said, you know, this really is more my network than it is yours. I wouldn't do this on purpose. And, uh, uh, um, but it was, an, it was a learning experience, as we say. Uh, and uh, adjustments were made, and, and uh, that problem went away. Uh, but as Len talked about, so that's one example of the kind of thing that uh, Len was describing of learning about the dynamics of the underlying machinery and how to, um, how to deal with that. 
fortunately today that doesn't happen the uh, there's there's enough resiliency and enough uh, controls inside the uh, uh, network so that the whole network doesn't crash all at once so there was some interesting crashes though while on that subject steve you opened up a lovely pandora's box of stories <laughs> there was one time when the harvard switch claimed it had zero delay paths to every other node in the network that was a software yeah. and so all the traffic in the network found its way to harvard and every time harvard sent it back out it came right back to harvard so finally the harvard network the harvard crashed and the network came down but there are some other interesting stories. For example, the very first line from UCLA to SRI, that link was in there, and you can see the evolving topology remains there until April of 1972, and that link is gone. And, you know, you can be a hero by adding more links to a network. But if you remove a link and the network fails, you're no longer a hero. So it took some careful topological design technology to be able to design the, the, op, the topologies as we run along. And the argument is you can't design a topology on the back of an envelope. It's far too difficult. Well, the fact is by November of 1972, the network looked like the back of an envelope, which is a kind of ironic, interesting story. Um, another case where the network went down is one day they doubled the storage in the switch, the hardware storage and the network went down. And that's a longer story, but just by adding capability, that caused another kind of failure in the network, and down it went. It was a software bug, but they were wonderful. We could go on and on and on telling you about the kinds of failures that occurred. But each time we found them, we fixed them, and it never happened again for that reason. The, those are, yeah, sure, go ahead, Tony. I was gonna say that while the, the network as a whole doesn't go down anymore, um, <clears throat> routing errors or other errors cause major parts of the network. Gmail, for example, has gone down on several occasions because of some configuration error at Google um, and similar stories. So things we, the network itself doesn't go down, but important parts have sometimes had problems. I, I couldn't help myself thinking about that those kinds of routing errors, we seem to be having those these days still, you know, like, you know, advertising paths that are not there. Um, I've heard that <laughs> before. <laughs> you know, one, w Werner Herzog interviewed me for his, his uh, documentary, and he asked me, can the network go down totally? And I said, no, there's too much redundancy. It's awfully hard to do. And then he came up with a wonderful comment. He said, what if there was an enormous solar flash from the sun? That would take the network down. It would take you and me down as well. Yeah. <laughs> so th th those are some wonderful stories, guys. Uh, I, ha I have a sort of a um, very, very short personal story. Uh, my first IDF meeting was the IDF 66 in Dallas, Texas which is famous because it was the ATF of the flood. I remember standing in a hotel lobby and there was a floating wooden elephant right beside me at some point. <laughs> yeah. was, and one of those nights at the hotel bar, I remember overhearing stories about the TCP IP migration and how people even made t-shirts saying that, way. I survived the migration. So yeah. I went, Probably been waiting all these years to have the opportunity to ask you guys about how was that migration? Uh, how, was it indeed that terrible? It was fundamentally slow um, approaching that date, but the network did not come down. Uh, it was decreed and it happened. Of course, different sites took different times to adjust. Uh, at UCLA, it was actually fairly easy for us because by that time, we were running um, uh, Berkeley Unix, which already implemented TCP IP. So we didn't really have to do anything other than switch to TCP IP. But other sites had to do a lot of work implementing TCP IP and switching their applications to use it. Steve? I... Uh... 
uh, was not part of that transition process because I had uh, turned my attention during that period to to other uh, matters. But um, as a more general comment, uh, you heard earlier, uh, Charlie, say everybody had to build their own hardware interface, for example. And uh, and then you, you, you just heard uh, Charlie mention that later UCLA was running Berkeley Unix. Um, so there was an evolution uh, from the very earliest days uh, from one at a time implementations of both hardware and software to uh, replication so that you could uh, share the results. First, the results were shared between laboratories and then in relatively short order, there were products. Uh, you could buy a hardware interface for a, a PDP-11 from uh, DEC, uh, from Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, they sold it as a special product, but you could order it. And then over a period of time, there were companies that would make hardware interfaces, companies that would make the software. And then eventually, as we have now today, it's all built in and nobody has to think very much about it. Um, but that, that was an evolutionary period. It took place over several years. Uh, one very important part, which uh, has affected everybody, is the uh, small scale. How do you connect a bunch of computers within a relatively small area, it's the so-called local area network issue? And there was a period where there were a lot of competing technologies, ring networks and uh, uh, other kinds of things. And the one that emerged as the winner uh, was the Ethernet, which uh, Bob Metcalf and his team at um, Xerox Park had put together. Uh, using some ideas that came out of the Aloha project at uh, Hawaii, which used radio communications between uh, a central computer and a bunch of terminals. Um, so, and, and then uh, uh, with that experimentation of, of developing the Ethernet, Sun Microsystems put Ethernet interfaces into all of its computers and made that the standard, and uh, the world changed at that point. Um, and uh, nowadays, it's hard to imagine buying a computer that you can't just connect to everything else. You know, talking about CSMA, uh, Abramson uh, came to a meeting one time proposing um, a thing like CSMA, and I was there with one of my students, Fuad Tobaji. And on the plane home, we looked at the equation he put on the board, and he said, no, that's not right. So we looked at it, we corrected it, and that became a PhD dissertation for Fuad. And for what actually coined the term carrier sense multiple access. Is that right? Yeah. Um, the, the other side of that is uh, uh, Abramson had come, I was working at ARPA and Abramson came into the office and I had not been paying attention to the Aloha net, but uh, I was talking with him and he's describing it. And I was quite uh, impressed with the idea that you just have these terminals send whenever they want and um, use the acknowledgement process to sort out collisions. Um, and I took home the proceedings that we had in the office uh, that had his paper in there, and I had it that came and visited me and stayed on my um, sofa bed. And uh, I said, uh, this is an interesting paper. You might find this interesting. So he read that paper, and he too um, got annoyed with the uh, mathematics of it and uh, went home uh, back to Xerox Park where he was working and took the ideas, put them in a cable, and there we have the Ethernet. So I, I have had the singular pleasure and distinction of being the host of the father of the Ethernet. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, one other point talking about the imps, the switches that BBN put together. Um, the idea which simplified Charlie's life and Steve's life and my life was to create a special switch, we now call them routers, we call them imps or packet switches then, separate from the host computer. The idea was to take all the communications functionality out of the host and not burden it with all that complexity and put it all in a dedicated machine, we now call them routers, that greatly simplified the design of the network and the kinds of interfaces that we had to create. Instead of doing truly major surgery in the operating system, we did minor surgery, as Charlie and Steve described, to allow us to talk to the network. And that was true for every other site on the network. That's by okay. the way, the gentleman who, who suggested that separation is Wesley Clark, Wes Clark out of Lincoln Laboratory. 
And and uh, that, that's an absolutely crucial point, Lynn, and, and I'm glad you uh, included it. And I think if we, if it, since we're here 50 years later, it's important, I think, also to understand the um, technology situation at the time. It was a period when computers were generally very expensive, and they were large and they were bulky. And Wes Clark was very interested in small computers and uh, had a lot of experience with what you could put into a small computer and make it uh, cost effective to have as a, essentially an early version of a personal computer for laboratory use. So uh, the, th that decision to aggregate the switching process in a separate computer was uh, rather extraordinary and revolutionary in the sense of, of, you mean we're going to buy a new computer for every site? Um, that would not have been uh, financially sensible even a couple of years earlier. And of course now uh, you can't count the number of computers in your pocket, much less the ones in your, in your laboratory. But it, it's a Moore's law effect. It was the, the uh, very rapid decrease in cost of computation, uh, the very rapid increase in the amount that you could do for a given dollar that made that decision uh, just barely feasible. Those, those routers, the, these imps that we're talking about, were $100,000 US dollars in 1969 dollars. So that'd be like a half a million or more now. Uh, you go into a store and you you buy a router and it's got Wi-Fi and everything built into it for 25 bucks or less. You know, Steve, you raise another interesting point. You mentioned Moore's Law had to come in to allow some of this to happen. The fact is, the idea of what we now call an internet was in the minds of visionaries more than 100 years before the ARPANET, more than 100 years from now, 50 years before the ARPANET came in. There were visions of what this could be, and they are articulated in writing. The fact is, as you say, the technology had to catch up to the vision. And when technology came, then in fact, it could be implemented, and the ARPANET, hence the internet, was the manifestation of that technology development. I have a, a question from the audience, which is, uh, I, I guess, um, this is comes from Venezuela, Alexis from Venezuela, and it, I think this is this is something we all want to hear from you guys. Is how how you how do you picture how do you see the next fifty years of the internet? What 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 are the next innovations you think may have an impact on the internet? Let's say I don't know artificial intelligence, Internet of Things. I don't know. So you're asking two questions, or, or she is. She's asking about the underlying infrastructure, and she's asking about the applications. Exactly. And as I've said many times, the infrastructure is far easier to, to imagine. You mentioned one important component, the Internet of Things. Um, I believe that, uh, as I said back in 1969, this network will eventually become invisible. It will disappear into the infrastructure. You won't have complicated devices you have to play with, but you will be able to talk to a room, a space, wherever you are, and converse with a thing called the internet using language, haptics, gestures, even brain internet interfaces, which are now being developed. And you won't see it. It'll be as easy to use as electricity is. It's a plug in the wall. You don't see it. You plug in easily and you get the service. You don't care how it's made. So the way to basically unwind that is to, in my mind, we will see a pervasive global nervous system across the planet called the internet or some other name, but that same functionality. But the applications, on the other hand, the only thing we can predict is that we, be, we will be unable to predict the applications. We have been surprised over and over again with explosive sudden applications that dominated the internet that we didn't see coming. First example was email, then YouTube, then Instagram, then social networks, then peer-to-peer, -peer, then search, on and on and on. So it is gonna be an unpredictable, wonderful, surprising technology which will allow the youth of today and tomorrow to continue to contribute. That's my soapbox. <laughs> 
And there are some serious technological challenges. For example, when there's only a few people writing applications, you can, if there's a bug, you can fix them. But when you have Internet of Things and millions of devices and a bug occurs which allows them to be controlled and suddenly remotely by someone, nefarious actor, and suddenly they can take this network of devices and do bad things. So we have some serious technological challenges on, on the security and the privacy of those devices. You know, I want to be able to have the camera in my house and the, the Google Home and all these other things, the Alexa. But I want to make sure that it's secure. And there are some real tough problems. You know, I'll give you an interesting example that occurred to me just yesterday. I was going to wire some money to a company for an investment purpose. And they had sent me the wiring instructions. And before I sent it, a few hours before, I received another email which says, uh-oh, that was the incorrect wiring instructions. Here's the correct ones. <laughs> Steve is smiling. And sure enough, it was a fraud. Now, it, it seemed to come from the right source. If I hadn't been suspicious about some aspects of that wiring instruction, I would have lost my money immediately. So you're right, Charlie. There are nefarious actors out there who are looking to do harm. You want to send one dollar first and see if it gets there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've been there, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, it's possible to lose money in many, many ways. Um, Lens, Lens gave my speech. I mean, if, if you'd asked me first, I would have said the internet's going to disappear from view. It's going to be everywhere. And uh, uh, you'll stop asking uh, when you go somewhere, is there an internet connection? Uh, just like you don't usually ask if there's electricity um, in, in most parts of the world that we deal with. Um, and, but as, and, and as Charlie said, there will be some challenges on security. And there'll be challenges. Security is a very big topic that has got a lot of different aspects that don't all have a single solution. So you have the problems of whether or not Are, are have bugs in them or whether they are they're uh, sort of airtight and then you have the social effects about uh, misuse of data or uh, surveillance and so forth um, impossible to say how it's all going to work out the, uh, the the social aspects not only include um, obviously improper use but uh, as everybody is now seeing uh, you have values that vary from in different parts of the world. So different countries have different ethics about free speech and about uh, uh, the role of the government versus individual uh, behavior. Um, and because the network now connects us all uh, across the globe, these differences now come into conflict with each other. There is no obvious solution that is going to be simple. This is going to be a pretty... Uh, a bumpy ride for a while. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, I, I have now a few questions from the audience. Uh, I think it's, it will be interesting uh, to spend these last 10 to 15 minutes uh, with some questions from the audience. Um, I'm going through the list. I'm, I'm going to start with one, but uh, I'm going to join two questions in one with it because I think they are more or less related. Um, I'm going to uh, how do you think the implementation of 5G, of the five, fifth generation mobile network, uh, will affect the internet, if in any way? And how do you believe that uh, the fact that now video is the leading uh, application on the internet will affect how the network scales in the future? So if I'll jump in, 5G is just another step toward the invisibility of the network, where you'll have excellent access in many areas, not everywhere. So the bandwidth will become less of a problem. But the, uh, the use of this network will continue to be a, a challenge. The, uh, the infrastructure, I have no question, continues to improve. 5G is just one example. Charlie, Steve? Hmm. I, I didn't say really, that. Did, go ahead, Charlie. I was going to say one of the problems with 5G <clears throat> is that while it increases the speed dramatically, it, had, it doesn't travel very far. So you suddenly need zillions of little access points 
where a, a regular cell tower today can go a mile or two, the 5G access points go a, a, a few th hundred or a thousand yards. So they have to put these little access points all over the place, which also has whole issues of, of the, the back hall to the main network. And it's, it's going to be a real complicated deployment. But as Len said, um, it's just another underlying transmission technology, which will increase speed and access as it's finally deployed. And there was a, a second part to your question that I didn't quite hear. Uh, uh, yeah. In addition. Uh, yeah. The, the, how do you believe, guys, that uh, now that the video video is the leading application on the internet, uh -huh. how does that affect how the network scales in the future? Yes. Well, that's a very interesting uh, thing because we've lived through a period when uh, the main communications was um, uh, ASCII, uh, you know, without any fancy fonts or anything, and then we we got fancy and fancy fonts, and then we got graphics, and and then now eventually we have video and and voice, of course. Uh, I've been. Um, I've been uh, humorously describing that I've been working on this network for technology for 50 years. And I didn't understand what it was all about. Now I do. My wife uh, spends all her time, FaceTime with the grandchildren. And uh, that is, from her point of view, what the internet is all about, FaceTime with grandma. Um, there's another aspect besides 5G that is going to be pretty interesting. Uh, and we're already seeing a little bit of it. You're going to see a great deal more, I think, that, that will very positively affect uh, Latin America. And that is low, low Earth orbit satellites. Um, it takes a long time to get up to a geosynchronous orbit. And it's a half of, it's a, about a quarter second up and down and uh, half a second round trip. Uh, when you have low Earth orbits, it becomes feasible to have essentially real-time uh, communications. And you can reach uh, the rural areas, the mountainous areas, uh, in, in a way that is very hard to do over landlines. Um, so I think that this, they will play a big role in reaching the second half of the population. We have about half of the world's population connected now. And uh, look at how to reach the rest of the world. Um, I think that that will play an important uh, uh, important role. That's a great point, Steve. But the streaming uh, concept is rather interesting. I have two comments about that. The first is we can thank a lot of the ability to do streaming traffic to a researcher named Danny Cohn, who many years ago ask that TCP be separated into TCP and IP so that you could run UDP on top of IP, which allows streaming traffic to go through without the overhead and the correctness and the packets in order that TCP tends to require. So the capability was laid long time ago in the, early in the late 70s to, to provide for streaming capability. Second point is that since streaming traffic is becoming such a large component of the internet traffic, it does open up the possibility for another kind of architecture. Charlie mentioned circuit switching before. Circuit switching was woefully inadequate, as I said, for handling computer-to-computer -computer communications. But it turns out that with technology improving, one can introduce something called fast circuit switching, where you set up a bandwidth, a pipe, you stream some traffic and you let go when you're done quickly because the capability is there these days. And once we go to, if we go to a fast circuit switching kind of system, we get another advantage because circuit switching is a kind of space time allocation of bandwidth, which means that one could send data through a network without carrying the source and destination address. It's all determined by where you are um, and when you're there to determine what the rest of your path is, that's a kind of, as I say, a space-time allocation. If that were the case, if we could send data without source and destination address, that adds a great deal of security to the traffic. Because if you start capturing traffic or sniffing it, 
a few bytes come by, you don't know where they came from, where they're going for, they may or may not be encrypted. It's not that useful as it is now when I can tell where it's coming from, where it's going to. So there are, it's opening up the potential for new architectures, certainly in greenfield cases where there's no internet yet to be designed in such a fashion. But that's a research subject. That's, a, that's an excellent point. And let me add just a, a one little technical comment. The original focus on packet switching was to make use of the um, uh, bandwidth in a very efficient way. Uh, uh, the, what turned out very quickly was that you needed space in the routers, in the, in the switches uh, for the buffers. And the original switches had very, very little space it's been very, very important that memory has become cheap and that you can have enough memory so that you can have the, uh, uh, the way of routing these things and uh, doing the very fast switching that Lynn has described. Thank you, guys. Uh, for, for a minute, you brought, you brought that nightmares of something called ATM, which I'm sure you all, all remember. ATM and frame relay and so forth are all various aspects of, of exploring that trade-off between addressing and pre-allocation of space and pre-allocation of slots uh, on the uh, on the circuits and so forth. Yeah, I kind of liked ATM, but I, when I started liking it, it died. So. <laughs> So uh, I have two more questions. Um, uh, Wilfrido from Ecuador has a, a question that I think is very interesting. And um, let me translate that into English. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you guys started working on technical coordination, I would say? Uh, what would the, I would say the early, the early days of the ATF, coordination on numbering and naming. Uh, you know, the kind of coordination that eventually gave birth to organizations like LACNIC. Steve, well, that's yours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, could, I could see it coming. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, the early discussions were these protocols and how to get the software working. And there was not uh, very much attention to formality and structure and uh, governance and so forth. But uh, over a period of time, it became clear as things scaled up that there needed to be a little bit of attention to that. So uh, it emerged in several different ways. We had these meetings that uh, the network working group, those meetings over a period of time went through several changes and it became the Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, we designed these protocols in an informal way and we did not have a acceptance process or a governance uh, you know that said this is this is formal but over a period of time it was desired to be able to 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 declare that the work had been done and that this was now a standard um and and we published through these uh, documents we called requests for comments nowadays by the time a document uh, a protocol is specified in a request for comments no more comments are required at all or requested uh, because there's been all this work beforehand. Um, it's been interesting to compare how all that emerged compared to the usual standards processes. Um, we don't have um, uh, a formal uh, conformance uh, process. Uh, it's sort of the marketplace determines it. You, you develop an implementation, and if it doesn't work with everybody else's, then um, it doesn't matter whether anybody says that it's the right implementation. Uh, and then as you... Uh, as you alluded to, the names and the numbers started to become important. So in the early days, it was very simple. One, two, three, four, you know, assign the next number. <coughs> the addresses started to get complicated. And uh, eventually, organizations like LACNIC um, had, to, had to be created to manage the address space. Uh, it would have been impossible to imagine that we would need such a thing in the very earliest days. And uh, it's the kind of thing that comes, I guess we call it a success disaster. Things grow so big that uh, you now have a problem. It's a nice problem to have, but it's nonetheless a problem. Um, and on the naming side, who would have ever heard of thought that uh, we'd have to create an organization like ICANN 
um, that uh, consumes $140 million a year or so just to coordinate uh, the top level of the uh, uh, address of, of, of the namespace. Um, these things are, are, are sort of evidence of the success and artifacts and, and or maybe they're just the necessary baggage if you take a negative view. Thank you, I remember, I remember in the early days of TCP IP when DNS was beginning to happen and they created the .coms, .edu, .org and our friend John Postel was effectively the czar of the names and could make the decisions whether a given group could have a particular name. And there were actually a team of lawyers that were constantly defending him against lawsuits because uh, somebody would, would say, I want that name. And somebody else would say, no, that's our company name. You can't have that name. You can't have IBM.com. And there were, there were lawsuits that he was being defended against. <laughs> Can't imagine. <laughs> so um, I would like to move to one last question, which comes from uh, El Salvador, but I think it's also an interesting question. Charlie made a few comments on this before. Um, Leo from El Salvador mentions that uh, he can actually see how you guys were able to improve your software, but he is sort of mystified, I would say, how you guys were able to bridge that hardware gap you have. Uh, the fact that you can, that there was simply no routers or interfaces or anything you could go out there and buy. How did you manage that? Well, at least at UCLA, we had a smart engineer. It started with Bulparanic and Newman wrote a spec and they knew they had to interface to lots of different kinds of computers. So they came up with a very simple four wire protocol <clears throat> which they specified, here's the voltage, here's the signal where you, the, the wire where you put the, the data bit on, here's the, the wire where you say, uh, I've got a bit on that wire, and here's a, the wire where you say, okay, I've taken the bit, you can repeat the process. And <clears throat> it was such a simple protocol that it was relatively easy to see how you might design hardware to implement to it, and also do, so each site had to, um, <clears throat> You know, figure out how you integrate it to the buses or whatever of your particular computer and implement this particular hardware. We had a very bright guy at UCLA, Mike Wingfield, who was able to use the hardware lab we had and build that interface. Some of the other they company, uh, yeah. some of the other uh, sites went out and contracted somebody to build their interfaces for them. Uh, and yeah. for the cases where <clears throat> the same computer was used multiple times, then once the first one was built, then other sites could have a copy of that same interface built for them. So we just managed through it. I had an opportunity to uh, talk with Mike Wingfield uh, a few days ago, uh, Charlie, uh, because you, you connected me up with him. I appreciated that. Um, and he pointed out something that I had not uh, realized before, but he, for his master's thesis, he had uh, worked out the hardware interface for a, uh, a display for a, for a graphics display to the Sigma 7. And uh, so he was already familiar with the and he was able to make use of that in designing the interface to the imp. So I think with uh, this last question, this uh, brings us to the end of our webinar. I would really, really want to thank you, all you guys in the uh, name of Lagnik and uh, all of us here in Montevideo. It was an amazing hour. And I, again, thank you for the time and thank you for being here during this past few days doing audio tests and everything. Uh, we genuinely appreciate that. Thank you very much, guys. Well, congratulations, awesome. and uh, it's a pleasure to have been with you. <clears throat> yeah, it's been a pleasure to, to join you today on the conversation. Good questions, good discussion, and a wonderful organization. Thank you. Thank you all. Now over to Maria. We will have uh, some final comments. I uh, thank you all for, for being here and participating with us. Uh, we are really happy to, to have this webinar today. And uh, we just wanted to add that this webinar is framed in our uh, LACNIC web webinars program that we have every month. We have like one or two webinars per month. We invite you all 
to join us. We have some webinars in English, some other ones in Spanish. And we, some people has asked, always they ask about the recording of this webinar. We will publish it in the website that you are uh, watching the stream right now. So we'll have it tomorrow in English and Spanish. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you to all the pioneers that have joined us today. And talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye.